So today is the 2nd of June, 2022, and welcome to today's Tech Hour. And the subject is setting up a workstation with DistroBox. I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'll let Nelson and Rod introduce themselves, and then I'll state the problem, and then we'll get going. So I'm retired now and I'm trained as a pure mathematician and that means that when I wasn't able to do mathematics I did tech as well or instead and in my retirement I'm trying to solve some problems that have been bugging me for a long time. Um, I'm a past chair of the UK Tech Users Group and I've served on the board. Uh, I'm not a great writer of packages uh, for CTAN, I'm much more looking at um, the problems we've got and how we can solve them. What are the causes of the problems we've got? And recently I bought a new computer or rather rebuilt my computer and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, perhaps we can ask Nelson to introduce himself to our so theme I, audience. I go, I go back uh, at the University of Utah uh, to tech in the 1970s when Don Knuth was developing at Stanford, we happened to have the same mainframe computers alone running different operating systems that still had compatible executable formats. So I was able to acquire over ARPANET uh, the latest versions of techware that Don was developing at Stanford and make them available here in Utah. Uh, I'm still working and uh, I co-manage a large mathematics department site with about 20,000 users. There are three of us who run these systems and along with all of this work, I have a, a virtual machine and physical mo machine collection of uh, computing systems to the, to the amount of more than 625 now not all of which are running at a given time, but typically two to 300 are. And so I have uh, virtual machines running many different operating systems uh, in the Unix world, uh, as well as different CPU types, basically all of the common historical CPUs that are run flavors of Unix are available in our, our test site. And I use that for testing software for the Free Software Foundation and other open source software developers. And uh, when Jonathan announced yesterday he was going to be talking about Toolbox, I decided to start experimenting. And so we'll, we'll be talking about that more today. But I'm I'm a brand new Toolbox user for roughly 24 hours. So Rob, off to you. All right. Well, my name is Rod Al Sedanis. I'm, I'm actually in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, my my trajectory to actually being on this call is is slightly a different path. I'm I'm actually a trained attorney, uh, and over the years, I've I've been interested in technology. Uh, in some cases, to overcome accessibility uh, concerns that I you know wanted to solve. Uh, you know, so I. I don't know, some four, five, six years ago, I started learning how to develop in Python. So today I think I'm, I'm a decent uh, computer programmer. Uh, and over the years, I've also challenged myself in opening computer boxes. Uh, so I have also built a few computer uh, computers. Uh, and, and typically it's, it's, you know, I've been looking for a way to merge my legal background, sort of the compliance aspect of it. Um, you know, with the technology uh, aspect. So that's that's sort of how uh, I got involved into, uh, you know, adopting different technological solutions, uh, anywhere from accessibility. I do draws scripting uh, in, in making applications accessible. Um, I'm also heavily involved in IoT technology, uh, especially with uh, smart homes, um, mainly, you know, for accessibility, but in my professional work, as well as uh, you know, compliance. So, you know, I'm not sure if it's if it's a known thing, but uh, um, there's probably uh, one to two percent of blind guys who actually open boxes and you know build computers, uh, you know, mount CPUs and different things. So, you know, happy to be here. I, I'm, you know, I'm always looking to learn. Uh, you know, from from colleagues. So, that's 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 briefly me. 
Thanks for those comments, Rod. I don't think we've had people with legal backgrounds on before. If we have, it's only been one or two. Um, and for the purposes of a future web audience of this recorded uh, video meeting, could you, I mean, the United States differs from most other countries in having not only a federal law system, but also state law systems. Um, could you, as a legal person, could you comment on the accessibility issues with respect to state law versus federal law? Does one override the other? Absolutely. I mean, it's um, no. It's a short answer to to your question. Absolutely. It, and you know, I've I've done a lot of uh, work in this you know accessibility space. Um, I mean, it's still you know, an open debate uh, in the US as it relates to the intersection of technology accessibility and really the statutory mandate. Um, you know, right now we have a lot of litigation uh, that, that's mainly focused on website accessibility, uh, morphing into other, um, you know, spheres as well. Uh, but definitely it's, um, it's, uh, it's a hot topic uh, as we speak, um, especially in, courts having to define, define the American with Disabilities Act uh, in cases where I hadn't envisioned, you know, encroaching on, um, you know, how businesses decide to design a website that operates as a storefront versus a physical one. So there, there are a lot of topics out there that's, um, that's currently trending. Yeah. So if, if we take the example of a website that's been uh, engineered to have certain accessibility qualities, which overrides the Pennsylvania law or the U.S. federal law? Well, or is the, that federal law always has um, supremacy over any statutory uh, uh, requirement? Uh, the, the state can go farther than the, you know, federal statute, but they cannot go. Um, they they cannot provision under what what's required by federal law. So anytime there's a conflict. Uh, you know, courts will resolve that conflict in favor of the uh, uh, of the federal statute. And in, 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 in the case of accessibility, especially website accessibility, there aren't a lot of state provisions uh, that go specific to, you know, to accessibility. It's still mainly dominated by federal law in the American okay. with Disabilities Act, that is. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, so I'll explain what my problem was. Uh, so actually there are three, three aspects to it. And uh, let me start with the easiest one, which is the hardware, which is, uh, I, I, I keep rebuilding my PC. I've still got the case I had 20 years ago, but I've changed everything else. So it's still the same PC. Um, and this time I changed the motherboard and everything that's connected to the motherboard, except the graphics card, which was still pretty good. So I spent about a thousand pounds on new components and I've got um, uh, a fairly mighty PC. I think I'm allowed to do that because the last one was 10 or 12 years old. And I'm hoping that what I've done now will last for another 10 or 12 years old. 12 years and that's 500 weeks so two pounds a week isn't too bad for the depreciation on a pc so just to put some numbers on it it's got a 24 thread cpu that's 12 cores running at about 4.7 gigahertz 64 gigabytes of ram and a terabyte of mvme storage mvme is a form of solid state disk except it communicates through the PCI bus, which means it's much, much quicker. And on this machine, it's actually PCI 4 rather than PCI 3. So it's not throttled by the bus. It's, it's going to be very quick. Uh, and I had to buy a new cooler and all, all the bits came to about a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars. And I have the problem of sort of moving over to this new setup. And I've decided to go from Ubuntu 18 to Ubuntu 22. So 
And I was aware that, well, when I started using computers, I realized that you had to use directories. At some point, you had to use directories. When you had more than about 50 or 100 files, you had to use a directory. You had to have some directory structure and naming structure and organization and so forth. And if I've got a, an equivalent of four or five or six or eight PCs, ordinary PC powers on my desktop, then I need to have somewhere managing all, all of this. And one of my ambitions is to do large scale mathematical calculations. And another is to um, get uh, the tech live distribution and uh, so to speak packaged into uh, Git and another is to do large scale testing of documents for accessibility. Um, so there are people that uh, have done that sort of thing on the archive. So um, we had Bruce Miller and I forget his name come to the Tech Hour a few weeks ago and they're processing, they're, they're converting documents on the archive with the next, the STEM, the archive of STEM documents, converting them into uh, HTML plus um, MathJax, MathML, uh, partly for discoverability for search and partly for accessibility. So I'm interested in doing that, those sorts of things. And so I sort of see a workstation as a cross between a server and a PC. Uh, somebody the other week said a workstation is a server that has a graphics card. And I think that was the correct definition for about 30 years ago. Um, so I started dabbling in virtual machines and I had this idea that I would reproduce my current PC in the new PC as a virtual machine so that I'd have a smooth transition from the old home to the new home, if you like. And I came up against a problem with that that's quite interesting, um, which is related to what I'm doing with, with Git. Uh, the other thing I found is that something called Vert Manager, which is the sort of old fashioned way of doing it, isn't up to scratch. And Nelson and I might have a conversation as to what Vert Manager is and what was and is. And, why it is and isn't up to scratch. So uh, another aspect of it is that um, the accessible, the, the, the frameworks, the, the software that people have assembled for producing PDF and other accessible and more directly accessible outputs from a single tech file tends to be rather complicated and involves individual configuration and modification. And so it's not easy to reproduce. It's, um, um, it's a bit like uh, in engineering, for example, in an aeroplane, you'll have maybe two prototypes. And the purpose of the prototypes is mainly to check that the plane will fly and to determine the flight characteristics and also to learn experience. But the prototypes are prototypes and they're not ready for production. And at some point you move over to produce a production prototype, which is where you figure out how you're going to set up a production line to produce these things. So I know of some accessibility work that never really got beyond the prototype and never got to the production prototype. And I know of some other accessibility work where the installation process is rather difficult and complicated. Uh, and I have tried a couple of, um, what's the word? Um, um, note taking facilities uh, that there's, they're called Zettelcaster, which is uh, a, a box containing small slips. They were used more or less by Linnaeus uh, and to a certain extent by Darwin. Uh, and 
I checked, looked at a couple of units for that, and they produce PDF outputs on the basis that we'll generate LaTeX, and it's your job to find some system using LaTeX that will produce the PDF because they don't want to mess with it. So this whole thing of reproduc reproducibility of complex software is quite important for the tech community, and I think quite important for the accessibility community. And here's one more feature why it's important, and Rod might be interested in this as a lawyer, which is the, the by and large documents that get produced as print, the print is correct because that's carefully vetted and so forth. But the accessibility features might be limited and need to be changed. And if the accessibility is created at the same time as the PDF, the whole document has to be reprocessed. But the PDF has to come out the same because there's nothing wrong with the PDF. So uh, the ability to repress, re reprocess documents is actually really, really important for adding accessibility and improving accessibility. Um, it's arguable that old articles on the archive, old math articles and physics and computer science articles on the archive, if they're well written, will be susceptible to conversion to something accessible because they can be reprocessed. So the ability to reprocess objects rather than throwing away all the word sources and the page maker sources and the InDesign sources and just keeping the PDF might be very important in terms of um, providing um, post-production accessibility. So I'll stop at that and I'll sort of move on to the problem that I had. And that's going to be quite interesting because I'm going to share a console. Uh, and so I'm going to start screen sharing, share screen, and uh, sorry, I have to find the right window. Here we go. So you should be, well, Nelson, you should be seeing my window and it's. Yes, yeah, so I, I see a terminal, a terminal yeah. window that says G find that pair. Yeah, okay. So let me explain what the problem is. And I've got a command here that involves root. So it's assuming that there's a folder called git alt obj available at root. And it does some processing using material from that location. So let me backtrack a little bit, which is what I want to do is allow people that want to, to set up a folder on their machine that contains in a sort of compressed form, the past 10 years of Tech Live. And because it's in compressed form and there's a lot of duplication, that is actually not big. It's about 10 gigabytes, I think. And because it doesn't really belong to any particular individual and it's a system resource, you, you expect it to go in root, in, in the root folder, so it's owned by the system and not by an individual. And another example of that is a list of words, the dictionary of words that's used for spell checking. That is not owned by individuals, it's owned by the system. And um, any sort of large amounts of system-wide data should be owned by the system and not by individuals. You shouldn't have your own sort of personal database of uh, geographical information, for example. You might reference it to say, here's my grocery shop, here's where I live. But if you're gonna have a lot of geographical information available to users of your computer system, you put it in a shared area that's administered separately from individuals. 
So on my old machine, I wanted to set up such an area for all this information and I put it in the root folder and I put it in a separate partition so that I could manage things better. And that turned out to be a real problem in terms of moving what I was doing to the new machine because I had to move that sort of configuration as well. And I sort of hard coded things in. I won't go into why it was a problem. I think Nelson will probably see why it could be a problem. Um, and whilst I was fiddle, miss, work, uh, struggling with all this, I saw an article in the register. I'll put a link in the chat for later, later that talked about distro box and it said, Oh, you gave a short description of DistroBox, and I'll read it out if I may. If you routinely have to work with the multiple distributions, then DistroBox can save you a lot of time and effort. It's intended to simplify the creation and use of Linux containers, making it easy to run one distro on top of another without the overhead of virtual machines. Uh, a quick word for the technical on this, um, Linux has a kernel and most Linux systems have basically the same kernel. It's like having the same engine. And then when the system boots, the kernel calls program number zero, which is called init, which sort of does the whole boot process. Um, so the the um, distro box and Docker share, all the systems share the same kernel, but use it to run different distributions or different instances. It's, it's, it's really quite clever. And a lot of people have been working on it in a long time. So uh, that got me into DistroBox and I made, made a decision to put it into today's tech hour. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually run the command. Um, and but before I do that, Let's put a remove two files that are created and we'll create them again in a moment. I've created locally a folder called git alt obj. And it contains a folder called tech live and it contains a folder called pack. And it's got a lot of packed files in it. And If I determine the size of that folder, it's 33 gigabytes. So I've got 33 gigabytes of packed data, and that's tech live for the last 10 or 12 years, basically, 33 gigabytes. And there's a bit of compression going on, but I haven't, um, there's a lot of duplication still to be removed from year to year to year to year. And the script I've got will create a pack file from from two of these two of these years. Um, I'll stop from it. You at least can read that, Nelson. Yes, but it's a long command line and probably the details aren't relevant for Rod. Right. Um, but, but, the, but, but the main thing is that I've put tildes in front of git alt obj, so it looks in my home directory for these objects. And so I set that running and 
You go zippity, 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 zip. It's counted the objects, it's writing the objects. It's finished. And I've now got two new files. And uh, one of the uh, occupying uh, 1.7 gigabytes altogether. So my task, if you like, is to make that a reproducible calculation. I want other people to be able to do those sorts of calculations. And they expect to find the things at some particular location. And typically in a server, as I said, it would be in root. Now I'm going to backtrack a little bit, which is if this is a workstation and I'm doing a long mathematical calculation, and some of them are long, the last thing I want to do is reboot the server in the middle of the calculation. And I don't even want to do anything that jeopardizes the long mathematical calculation. Uh, so any server uptime is really important. And one of the ways to protect uptime is to protect is to prevent people changing the system. And containers allow changes to be made and protect the system against change. And that's, I think, one of the key things for what's what's going on here. So that's the problem. Um, I think I'll try and move on to the solution, at least to the point of view of installing it. So the installation is quite simple. Uh, you have to install something called Podman, which stands for um, Pod Manager. There's another piece of software that stands for Container Manager, and it's called Conman. But this is Podman. So I've got Podman, and there's a line of code which I'm going to pick up that does the installation for me. So I've run this before, and Generally, you don't copy pieces of code from the internet and paste them into your command line. But anyway, that's installed DistroBox. And now I can run DistroBox. So I can do DistroBox create name test. Ah. Uh, I had to put a prefix in. So I'm going to run the command. And it's created a test distro box. And now I enter the distro box. And the first time you enter a new distro box, it takes a little while because it has to install stuff. It's lazy. Its technical name for this is lazy. So it's installing the basic packages. So test is the name of the distro box, which contains a Linux distribution. And Red Hat is the default Linux distribution. Uh, this will take a few minutes. Do you want to talk while this is installing, Nelson? I wanted to ask a question. The The web page that I found about DistroBox also mentioned this thing called test, but it wasn't clear to me whether this is a mag sort of a, a name that's used locally to refer to some sort of standard distro 
or whether this is a magic name somewhere on the internet that identifies a particular distro. Because as you ran this, it didn't say I'm installing Red Hat Linux. It just said installing this, installing, setting up, integrating, and so on, and then says complete. I I I I think that's a sort of they made things too easy. Um, uh, let let me first of all say we've the console has come back and it now says JFine at test, whereas previously it was JFine at pair. So I'll just exit that. And now if I enter test, it's really quick. And the word pair in the command prompt changed to test. And if I exit that, I'll exit that so that I can. OK, so here I've got a separate window for the test environment. I could create a distro box. Um, who, um, without a name at all. This is what I've discovered and it will choose. My distro box, it already exists, so we can't do that. Uh, 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 let me create a Nelson. Uh, sorry, minus create. I'm going to create a distro box called Nelson. And it's just created it. And it's basically a clone of what we just did. And if we do enter Nelson, then we're having to install the basic packages again <laughs> and and we'll have a no we'll have another container called nelson uh, which sort of represents a machine i think i've answered your question but i may not have said it correctly and you may want to reformulate my answer yeah it it's clear that it's doing something and creating some sort of a distro but it's not being very uh, clear about which distro is it making. But okay, I guess one so can probe around afterwards and ask, well, what do I find in the etc. directory with release in its name? Well, uh, well, there's a folder called Red Hat Release. And if you cat that folder, we see it's Fedora Release 36. Okay, so that seems to be the default operating system then when you do a create. Yeah. Uh, and I found in the man page for Toolbox, uh, it has a long list of various distros with short names and long image names that you can use to install things from. So there, it isn't just the door that you can get this way. You make quite a number of other ones. Uh, this is leading to something that's really important, which is basically anything that's in Docker Hub you can install. Yeah. So, so, so the the trick to creating a reproducible distribution, re, something reproducible, a machine that other people can use, is to, is to create the machine or create the recipe for the machine on your own resources and put that recipe up on the docker hub and if the recipe is correct then it can be downloaded and the server will be created the virtual server will be created according to that recipe hmm. so no. this is something this is something that caused a big mind shift in me because i'm used to thinking of a server as a physical thing a physical computer whereas in fact it's a piece of software that runs on a physical computer, but the connection is sort of somewhat somewhat loose and the magical thing can happen, which is a virtual server can migrate from one physical machine to another 
if the virtual server is actually a virtual machine. Um, so that means that um, the physical server can have downtime without the virtual servers having any downtime at all. That's quite mm -hmm. marvelous. Um, yeah, no. One one question this raises, however, is since it's pulling down these various operating system environments, containers uh, from Docker Hub, you know, to what extent do we have confidence that the ones that are there aren't Trojan ones that do nasty things like keystroke logging and sending them off to intelligence agencies or foreign countries? Well, uh... I mean, given the current situation in Europe, this is highly significant. Okay, so so there's two things. The first thing is, are you getting what you're expecting to get? And having a secure hash and having a signature is important there. And then the other thing is, another thing is, can you build the thing yourself? I mean, some people don't trust software unless they build it themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's coming about recently is Linux distribute reproducible builds, right? The ability to not just build the machine, build, build the software on your own PC, but to build it and get exactly the same outputs as the ones that are put up for download. Right. So if you want a reproducible build, you must not put the current date and time anywhere in the resulting output. Right. Or host names or IP addresses or any other local information. That's right. That's right. And um, anything that sort of has got a randomness to it, you have to reduce the randomness. So if you tar something up, the order in which the files appear is determined by the operating system just by its convenience. So a, a tar archive um, could come up in a random manner. I read an article where they found that a scientific calculation was giving variable results when it shouldn't be. And they found that what happened was they were globbing files to get a list of files to process. And the glob wasn't in a fixed order. Yeah. So, yeah. The sort uh, command can be really important in creating such things. Yeah, uh, uh, and actually that was one of the things I've been working along in, in that little command, which was I was finding that the pack files I was producing weren't, weren't completely deterministic and I didn't like that. So I was figuring out how to solve that. Yeah. So this it's, is it's how important. we- It's uh, important. I was just gonna comment. It's an important issue for computer users to understand that they're used to using uh, GUI file managers and directory listing commands, and those tend to sort things into alphabetical order. But in reality, all modern systems have the files stored in a more or less random order, and it's only the directory listing command or the, the file manager that displays them in a sorted order. So this means when you run a tool to say archive a tree with zoo or zip or arc or tar and so on, um, the order those files appear is not going to be sorted. It's going to be whatever order they were found on the disk. And that's why some pre-processing with the sort command will be critical if you're going to have reproducible archives. Yeah. Um, so reproducibility is, is one of the things that will guarantee security. And uh, um, uh, how do we say? Uh, and that's one of the key aspects of computers. Do you expect the computer to be a machine that is reliable? So it always gives the, sa the same calculation should always give the same result. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other, other problems of that. The, so that's one of the big problems is ensuring that the same calculation gives the same result. And uh, reliable hardware is part of that. So, for example, error correcting memory. Then there's an, another aspect of it, which is, now let me get it right. Is the correct, is the calculation being done correctly? Right. It may be that you're always getting the same answer, 
but the calculation isn't being done correctly for some reason. Perhaps there's a, a mistake in the algorithm. And then another thing is, is the correct calculation being done? And that's mm -hmm. a question of meeting human needs. Um, so when you say, can we trust this software? That involves all those different aspects. Are we doing the same calculation? Is the calculation being done correctly? Is the correct calculation being done? And key logging is not part of the correct calculation. Key logging renders the calculation incorrect. Uh, so the, the question of trust in computing is not just paranoia about the, the spy masters, but it's part of the stri struggle for reliability. Mm -hmm. Yes. I I'm looking at the clock. We normally stop at half past seven, or at least allow people to leave if they want to and stay if they want to. And I think we've, what is really impressive for me is that DistroBox is easy to do the things I want to do. So the calculation, so I can now create things in my local area, which is the right thing to do, and then export them to a new container, a new distribution. And Alpine Linux is very often used for containers. It's, it's got a lot of benefits for that purpose. And I can when I build the container, I can say at the root, in the root folder, put my git alt objects folder from my area in there. So this takes us on to something which I learned about yesterday, which is called Silverblue, which is what's called an immutable operating system. And as far as I understand it, that means that once it's booted, the operating system can't be changed without rebooting the whole machine. And this is a great big security plus, because even if a miscreant gets in, there's a limit to what they can do. They can't compromise the operating system files. So there's a certain number of files that can't be changed except through a reboot. And by the way, Chromebooks work in exactly the same way. When a Chromebook up updates, uh, that's how it updates. And only by dis uh, disenabling security features can you change the um, operating system other than through a reboot. Whereas on a normal package manager, you do an apt get update and apt get install. And these things get updated under user control and essentially with no restrictions on them if the person has got super user permissions. And if they're a miscreant, they have super user permissions. Um, so the um, distro box allows you to create a mutable image on an immutable base. And if you think about that, most buildings have an immutable base, which is called the foundations, which are dug into soil, resting on concrete and so forth, and then have something mutable on the top, which is the building itself. So that's an analogy for what we've got. Um, I'll add one more thing, which is there's a really nice video on the DistroBox homepage, which was very persuasive for me because the person was demonstrating a way of working, which was very close in many ways to what I wanted to be doing. And in particular, the type, tight integration between all the various containers that you set up was very attractive because I, all, all the containers you set up by default share the same home folder, which is your own personal home folder. And that's really convenient for sharing information. And there's no having to SSH into these things or anything else like that. It's all quite straightforward. And also the X Windows or the Wayland, if you're using Wayland, another window manager, is quite straightforward. So what, what I wanted before I discovered or came across DistroBox, what I wanted was 
a small secure system that managed the disks and managed the display, the monitor and the video card and a few other things. And then I want everything else to be sitting elsewhere. And that's exactly what the person who gave the demo talk for DistroBox showed. So he has a sort of small system and then everything else is done in containers. And that's the way the Linux world has gone with the world of Docker. And Podman is a relative of Docker. It does the same sort of thing. And I think can use Docker configuration files to create containers. So that's all very interesting. And uh, what I've realized is that containers are portable objects. They're recipes for a server. You don't create a server. You create a recipe for a server. And then you run that recipe as often as you want. Which is why I mentioned earlier this conversation about the prototype and the production prototype. So the prototype works. That's its big quality. It works and it can be measured. The production prototype can be made one after another after another. Mm -hmm. And when you're creating containers, what you're really doing is you're creating recipes. Yeah. I'll stop at um, that point. You, you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, that we might come back to the distinction between these containers and toolboxes and so on and virtual machines. And then uh, because there may be other viewers of this recording in the future who may be unfamiliar with virtual machines, perhaps I could give a brief description. A virtual before, machine is essentially... Go on. I was going to say I wanted to give Rod a chance to... He's okay. sitting very quietly. Can we give Rod a chance to contribute? Yes. <clears throat> no, no, J Jonathan, I'm, I'm following the, uh, the contribution. I have limited experience with virtual machines. I, I have, uh, you know, I have, you know, essentially built a few, um, uh, a few systems on um, uh, uh, something not as complicated as what you just did. So, yeah, it, it's fascinating. I, I, I prefer to, uh, to follow through. Uh, in, okay. in... Let's give the microphone back to Nelson. Okay. So uh, when you install a virtual machine uh, and there are essentially all modern operating system have some sort of a virtual machine capability on Mac OS, it's called Parallels on Microsoft Windows, uh, there are some virtualization solutions. There on the Linux, sorry, in the Unix world, there's virtual box, there are jails, there are uh, containers, there are BERT manager, KVM, QEMU, and so on. But essentially what you do is you use a graphical user interface to uh, go through the setting up of a virtual machine, telling it how much memory, how many CPUs, how much disk, and so on. Uh, uh, you give it the name of an ISO image to boot from, and then you tell it to boot. And then the ISO image proceeds to offer you typically an installer screen where you can then install the software from that ISO image onto the virtual disk. And when you get done, you have effectively a standalone computer that you reach either via uh, the virtualization management software in a console window, which is not very convenient because it's relatively primitive, or, or you reach it via secure shell access, which is now available on essentially all operating systems. Now, the problem here, of course, is that um, rebooting one of these virtual machines, typically in my environment, takes anywhere from five seconds up to one to two or three minutes. And so switching VMs is not something you do quickly. You tend to start them and leave them running for days, weeks, months. Uh, it has the advantage, however, that it really is totally encapsulated. The virtual machine uh, can only see its own disk image, which is a file on your underlying operating system. Uh, in our case, that means that file is resident in a, a ZFS file system or ZFS, uh, which has the ability to do snapshotting. And so we do frequent snapshotting. So we have 
uh, <clears throat> data recoverability and reliability, independent of whether the virtual machine operating system can do that. And that's been extremely nice because many times we've found corruption after machine failures, and we simply go back to an earlier snapshot and recover the, the machine. The the nice thing that I see with the toolbox and and uh, 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 solution is that although the range of operating systems is limited, they start up extraordinarily fast, less than a half a second, uh, and. Uh, it, it has the disadvantage, of course, that that toolbox operating system can see exactly the same files that you can see underneath and uh, with the right user privileges could modify things. Now, of course, the operating system files are protected, but at least uh, you could, with one of these toolbox operating system instances, manage to wipe out your personal files and other directories because they don't have a protected system. That can't happen in a virtual machine because they have separate file systems. But for the things we've been talking about for uh, rapid access to a standard tech environment, uh, the toolbox approach looks extremely interesting. Uh, and I could see us offering in, in years in the future uh, a toolbox instance that can be downloaded instead of doing a download of the ISO image for TechLive, simply Here's a link to a toolbox instance, run the toolbox command and install it on your computer. It remains to be seen what's going to happen with, with Microsoft and Canonical. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, two or three years ago, Canonical, which is the company behind the Ubuntu distribution, partnered with Microsoft to develop a new port of the Ubuntu system onto the Microsoft Windows operating system. And they did it in a fairly general form where there are now about a half dozen different flavors of, of uh, Unix systems that can run on Windows system, subsystem for Linux, WSL, which some people pronounce whistle. Uh, and, and I think this is a very interesting development because in whistle, uh, you have access to files between the Microsoft Windows file system and from the guest Linux system. And so for people doing document production, if you decided that there were tools in a, say a Linux distribution uh, uh, of TechLive that you needed and they were absent from the Windows version, you could have that installed under WSL and you'd have immediate access to it. And certainly my limited experience so far indicates that WSL does start up the operating system fairly quickly and gives you the nice ability then to have common windows on your desktop, Windows computer, some of which are native Windows windows, that is capital W windows, um, and, and others are coming from one of the guest operating systems and they all look much the same. They have a title bar and you can move them around and you can copy text from one to the other. But what you're really doing is working in multiple operating system environments at the same time. So I think there's lots of exciting possibilities here for what people might figure out uh, what to do with these, these new technologies. And uh, it's going to be a fun several months in the future as we play more with them. So I'll pause at that point and ask for a commentary. Nelson, with that perspective, is there a perceived lag in sort of interacting, um, you know, with those two systems, I'm I'm thinking strictly in in terms of accessibility because that's one of the, you know, the challenges in being able to get too uh, up close and personal with, um, you know, virtual box and and you know that's the one I'm familiar with in in different uh, sort of virtual machines. But as you are moving things around, you're interacting with two different machines. What what's the lag visually perceived? Yeah, I, it, at least for for graphical operations, moving windows, drawing things on the screen, displaying text, running Unix commands, uh, they seem to be about as peppy within the virtual machine or the toolbox as they do uh, in the native system underneath. But uh, 
toolbox is for me are 24 hours old. So I don't know what would happen if you ask, say, a text to speech system to run on a window in your underlying operating system and compare the speech quality with that from a guest operating system running in toolbox. And that's certainly something we're going to have to experiment with and, mm -hmm. and try to understand. Because as you point out, it's really important that uh, you you can't have garbled text coming from a, a text to speech system because it becomes unusable. Yeah. And and the same is true of video. If you if you drop frames in the video feed, uh, the video system is unusable in that guest system. For, um, fortunately, video processors on modern computers are extremely powerful devices, largely thanks to the gaming industry that has driven the advances in technology. So. Now, in our department, for example, we have bought uh, about 250 Intel NUCs, and that's NUC for next unit of computing. These are boxes that are about 10 centimeters on edge and about five centimeters high, and they can drive two uh, large displays with 4K resolution uh, with full screen video without frame loss, and that's really remarkable because on our previous generation of hardware, uh, as soon as we made windows bigger than about you know, 10 or 15 centimeters, we got frame lost and, and audio loss, and it was just unusable. One of the things I'm interested in doing uh, is, I've got a Raspberry Pi and I don't use it to my shame. It's, it's Raspberry Pi 4 with four megabytes of memory. So it should, is seeing what it's like as an accessible platform. In other words, if I install NVIDIA in it and uh, start trying to do things with it, how, how well does it work as an accessible platform? And it, it, the Raspberry Pi, which is about the size of a packet, a deck of cards, um, will drive a 4K monitor at 60 frames per second, or it'll drive two of them at 30 frames per second. Uh, and it has a number of other capabilities. So it'll be very interesting to see how, how good it is at that. And if it is at least decent, then it provides a standard piece of hardware, which makes life so much easier when dealing with problems. Right, and that. the beauty is that they're astonishingly cheap. I've heard people quoting figures of 25 to $50 for a Raspberry Pi, which is yeah, comparable to buying a textbook. Yeah, they're also astonishingly unavailable at the moment. There's a, a big demand for them. Yeah, the, the, if, if it does the job, then that's got a lot, lot going for it. One of the things that I, I don't want to install Envy DA on my computer and sort of mess it about so that I can't do my sighted work. And the idea of setting up a blind, an emulation of a blind computer would is quite quite interesting to me. And uh, having some sort of virtualization, whether it's virtual machine or containers is the ideal way to do deal with this. What, here's two things that I find quite exciting about um, DistroBox and Toolbox. Toolbox is a, um, a sort of predecessor that is more closely associated, I think, with Red Hat. Um, so the first thing that I find exciting is that the values in that community of permanence and reproducibility. And part of that is your immutable operating system as a fixed point. And Don Knuth famously said when he froze tech, it's a great advantage, even though any system can of course be improved, it is a great advantage to have a fixed point. And I wish tech to be that such a fixed point. So these people also see the benefit of having a fixed 
reproducible fixed point. Tech is a reproducible fixed point. It's not just a fixed point on Don Knuth's machine, it's one that's shared across all of us. So that when Nelson and I do a typesetting calculation, as long as it's the same calculation, we get the same result. And because of Don Knuth's work, it's a good result. Um, another side to it is that the community, it seems that the, a lot of stuff is being done in service through containers. And these people have a sort of attitude that sort of fits in quite well with, I think, what tech should be, which is, well, one of the things tech should be, which is a back end thing that does all manner of typesetting, whether it's as a receipt for the milk delivery or uh, cricket scores or uh, a route guide or anything, anything personalized, for example. The idea of personalized document production is something that tech is very good at. And that's something that is useful in a large number of situations. Um, and the people who are doing the virtualization and containers are also very heavily involved in the back end work of modern websites. And at the front end, you've got the HTML5 system, which is advanced typography with user experience added, if you like. So they're people for whom the values of the tech community have some overlap and some interest. And this takes me to the final point, which is I searched for a Podman tutorial because it was new to me. I had no idea what it was. And I was suspicious of it because it wasn't Docker and it didn't have its own Wikipedia page. So the first thing I discovered was there's a presentation. The Wikipedia page links to a presentation of Podman given to CERN by somebody from Red Hat in the context, I'm sure, of scientific commuting, computing. And the problem I was starting with, which was being able to mess around with my workstation without destroying its fun functionality as a server, is scientific computing problems writ large. You want these people developing on these powerful machines without messing it up for other people. And um, I think Nelson is in a situation where you have large amounts of data, the, the, the Lee Group's atlas, the representations of Lee Group atlas. You have about a terabyte of data. I went to a conference where there was a talk on it. You have about a terabyte of data and people want to access to that data to explore conjectures and answer questions and so forth. So it's a bit like economists want to interrogate the census data to determine correlations. And they're not allowed to interrogate the census data for data protection reasons, but what they are allowed to do is submit queries. But the, for various reasons, you have to have software, the data is like the mountain and you have to go to the mountain. And the last thing you want is to have the mountaineers, the people exploring the mountain, damaging the mountain. So this immutability and then having something mutable built on top of the immutability seems to be a really crucial concept. And in some sense, that's what tech is. Tech is an immutable base on which other things have been built. So I like that. And anyway, back to the Pad Podman tutorial, this led me to a website called Catacoda with a Podman tutorial. And when you go to that tutorial, it'll fire up a virtual machine at which you can do Podman commands. And you can actually do Podman. And because it's a virtual machine, you can ask other questions along the way. It's not pretending. It's not a fake thing, it's a real thing, even though it's a virtual thing. So um, I found that very interesting. And at the top of the Catacoda side, there's a banner that says, 
we've been taken over by O'Reilly. O'Reilly has acquired us and the stuff that is publicly available is being removed over a period of time because O'Reilly is using it as part of their publishing platform. And they don't have the resources to do that and to protect Kat um, Katakoda from miscreants who use it to do cryptocurrency mining. But of course, you're setting up a server and so forth. Um, I think that's perhaps uh, putting a very pleasant gloss on the fact that a community resource is being lost. But what I find very interesting is that in 2000, I bought a fat book. I'll show you the fatness first. Right? It's almost as fat as I am. Um, so here's a fat book and it's called system administration and a lot of this is about concepts and you have to sort of read and understand and understand and read and so forth but with this age of virtual machines and cheapness of everything and so forth you don't need a bsd distribution on your pc or anywhere to um investigate and practice on bsd commands and in fact, you don't need anything except a web browser and a sufficiently powerful PC because you can run these things in your web browser. I mean, the performance is terrible. You know, uh, a command that should take a thousandth of a second takes a tenth of a second. <laughs> but um, uh, that's good enough for learning. It's not good enough for production. Um, so the whole climate is changing and O'Reilly started as a technical publisher and for computer software, the server farm is becoming the printing press. Let's think about it. The printing press, these pages are printed. Identical copies are made. These books are all identical, except for manufacturing errors. Identical copies are made in thousands from a formula, from a recipe, which is a PDF. A server farm is the same. All these servers are effectively identical. And each of them behaves identically and is serving a different customer at the end of the web browser. But the server par farm is the printing press that is stamping out one after another, after another, after another virtual machines that are set up to be identical so that people can do their stuff, can train, can use the hardware, use the software. And I think there's a really close analogy between what's going on with the printing press and what's going on with the server farm for using virtual machines to back instruction. And O'Reilly is a publisher, technically savvy publisher, that has gone from print and it's now become a content platform. And I think the Catacoda system is a publishing system. Catacoda is a publishing system of which the server is, a, of which the reproducible virtual machines are part. So it's a, um, in, in universities and elsewhere, there are these things called virtual learning environments, which are publishing systems of a particular type. And Catacoda have pioneered a different sort of virtual uh, publishing system. And for what it's worth, Jupyter Notebooks and what's called Jupyter Hub is also a publishing system focused on scientific publishing. So the whole realm of publishing is changing. And the, the fact that uh, a tutorial for Podman is available on Catacoda, and there seems to be some affinity between the technology of Catacoda and the technology of DistroBox makes me think that there are many benefits of my community, the tech community, getting involved in DistroBox and perhaps 
forming a small group interest group or something like that because the alignment of values and the um the fact that they're both publishing platforms docker hub is a publishing platform that publishes recipes for creating virtual machines it's a publishing platform it publishes recipes the 19th century was a great time for the mrs beaton's cookbooks publishing recipes so they're important i'll stop because i've said too much mm. i've gone over time too rod you're still here no this was fascinating um <clears throat> yeah it's it's um say whatever you like it's interesting i mean you know my my sort of bias perspective is always going to be you know as we move forward with the advent of computing uh and you know creating different solutions you know how accessible uh will those be because typically that that either is is, is serve as a barrier um or a you know or it, it caused that sort of disincentivize, you know, uh, ambitious minded folks to uh, to actually venture into it. So it, it was, it was, it was fascinating. I was trying to follow you in terms of issuing the commands and, and different things. And I kept asking myself is once you get in there, providing that um, you have a way of uh, navigating and understanding what's happening in, in those, um, you know, virtual machines, how first how, how what will the experience be in terms of you know is it going to be an enjoyable one where um you know accessible technology works where you, you know you, you can navigate around and, and get to visiting different directories and different things so that's sort of what i was thinking about uh but it, it's an important discovery um it's um yeah it's, it's fascinating let, let, let me respond to that in two, at least two ways. And I'd like to have a conversation with you afterwards. Do I know how to get in touch with you? Uh, we, we sh it should be because um, I think uh, I may have replied to one of your emails. If not, okay. I can reply to you just uh, as soon as we but get over. You're, you're, you're on the VI list, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we can get, we, we, we can continue this conversation. So uh let's start with the first thing which is okay this is going to be really bizarre but um video games there's a steam operating system which i've ignored because it deals with video games but it's likely for people who are cited to have the very best support for graphics cards and things like that and when i'm building my workstation I want the best graphic support I can have because I've got a 4K TV used as a monitor. And I'm seriously considering, although without much pre-thought, you know, it's it's on the on the list of things to consider, of using Steam OS because it it's good at controlling the monitor. Now, what's this related to you? How does this relate to you? Um, because you're not cited well the point is this that um with the distro box toolbox approach you have a big decoupling between the software that does the calculations and the software that does the rendering so you could use ubuntu to do the calculations and steam os or whatever to do the rendering so if we get a windowing platform that is accessible then we can use that to do the windowing and by windowing i mean navigation between 
different programs, minimizing programs, resizing programs, uh, alerting about what's going on, uh, all these things that have to be done by audio. So an audio windowing platform, if that's not a contradiction, could be built. And if you have that built on whatever is the best hardware, best um, operating system for that, wherever it's built, you can then run in containers your other stuff. So the applications you want to run, run in the running containers that support, that provide whatever the application needs to run. But it communicates with you through an accessible windowing system. So you only need one accessible windowing system. This is, what's the word? It's the sort of active imagination that only a stupid mathematician could come up with. Let's put it that way. It's, it's sort of uh, mathematicians, I like to think, are sort of, what's the word? Good at grand ideas, but they may not work. The, the next thing is more practical, which is, O'Reilly has is, ha, uh, bought Catacoda, I think, in 2019 or so. And that they're now, I think, getting ready to make big investments in it. Uh, it would be nice if the O'Reilly had community support and involvement in the accessibility of their platform of Catacoda as a publishing platform. And that is perhaps closer to your skills and special interests than the difference between a virtual machine and a container. Here, here's one more point that's worth registering here that we haven't discussed today, and that is, um, if you have a virtual machine, um, you own it, but you may need privileges on the underlying machine to create it in the first place. With the toolbox uh, approach, uh, anybody with an account on say a Linux system of some flavor can run the toolbox command, install another operating system, and then run the sudo command without supplying a password to install arbitrary packages in their private instance of that toolbox. Uh, and since I'm on the, the mailing list for problem reports on our computing systems, we several times a month have students trying to install packages that they don't really have privileges to do so. Uh, and quite often they're perfectly reasonable things. There's a piece of software we haven't found it necessary to supply, but suddenly they decide they need it. So, if toolbox has become a common approach to doing computing, then people will be, simply be able to run the package install commands for whatever particular software package they want. And in the Ubuntu and Debian worlds, there's of the order of 100,000 packages available. So there's an enormous quantity of software that we can't foresee in advance that people might want and, and therefore supply by default. And yet, uh, with toolboxes, they'll be able to, to install whatever they need and we won't have to worry about it because uh, it's in their own private instance of their operating system and poses no security risks for the rest of us. Let me correct you on that, no additional security risk. Yes, sure. So, so essentially it's a one-way street um as i'm thinking so the underlying configuration what jonathan refers to as the recipe the private instance can only it, it's limited well i think i probably should ask the question how is it limited in scope is it at the time of creating that recipe to stay with your um, phraseology, Jonathan, or is it 
at the time when it's deployed. Okay, so uh, uh, the the recipe may need permissions to be create, created, but the permission, okay. Uh, d d d d the, the easiest way to say that is that uh, when the machine is booted, the BIOS allow, enables virtualization. This, this thing requires something to be enabled in the BIOS, which is virtualization extensions. If the virtualization extensions are enabled in the BIOS, then the machine can do these clever tricks. And I have a straightforward installation of Ubuntu 2204, current one, and was able to install and create containers without using any administrative privileges other than the installing of Podman. So briefly, um, administrators can prevent this sort of thing happening or make it difficult. Um, but there's no particularly good reason, but if they're reasonable administrators, they're unlikely to use these powers. And then there are no new security holes opened up. The administrators in some sense, well, unless you have a system whereby installation of local software is prohibited, um, which I think might be possible on some Windows systems. Um, there's essentially, uh, essentially using distro box is legal. And, and unless you have a paranoid and draconian system administrator. Is that about right, Nelson, do you think? Yeah, no, I fully agree. But I think it's it's opening up a, a large number of new possibilities because at the moment with Toolbox, we can install assorted flavors of Linux of the order of a dozen or so. But there's many other operating systems out there, including Mac OS and Windows and large numbers of variants of the Berkeley Standard Distribution BSD family that uh, potentially could be provided in a similar way. Now, of course, the reason containers work the way they do in the Linux world is that there's a good deal of sharing. So that things that are coming down in the guest toolbox uh, that are already present in the underlying system don't have to be provided. The other thing that I've noted so far is that even if you as the root or administrator user on the computer use toolbox to install an instance of an operating system and install assorted packages on it, they aren't automatically accessible to all of your users. They have to go through the same thing. And I'm assuming that this means that there's essentially multiple copies of these same pieces of software being installed. Now, this doesn't matter in a single user environment with a personal computer on a, a laptop or desktop. But it matters a great deal in an academic environment with thousands of users. We we don't want a thousand instances of, of Ubuntu 22.04 installed in a toolbox uh, by our students. We'd rather provide uh, the basic operating system we feel is appropriate for them and let them install other things. So these are all things to be worked out in the future. But potentially, there's no reason why uh, at the administrative level, installation of software packages via toolbox couldn't be made visible to all other instances. Uh, but this uh, may well be a feature that comes in the future. I'm going to take a different approach to this, which is I've just looked at Docker Hub. Docker Hub is a bit like GitHub, except it's for Docker recipes. And I've done a search for accessibility. And there are 92 results for accessibility. So there are 92 accessibility recipes 
in Docker Hub, which is, depending on your predilection, disappointing or pleasing. Um, I'll, I'll put the link into the chat. There we go. Um, and the first one is an accessibility checker and there's, there's an accessibility crawler. And then there's a accessibility Drupal, accessibility book, accessibility request. Run tenon.io accessibility test via Docker. There's a somebody somebody called DCycle has submitted test a website for accessibility. So people are already using Docker to distribute accessibility software. What's happening is that people are writing software and then it, and then instead of saying, and this is how you install it on Ubuntu, and this is how you install it on Red Hat, and this is how you install it on so and so, and these are the prerequisites and so forth. They say, here's a recipe that creates an image that does the job for you. And, um, it might be an Ubuntu image, it might be an, a recipe for Ubuntu, it might be a recipe for Alpine or whatever, but at least they can create that thing and it's reproducible to other people. So, um, oh, here we go, WB Transport user interface for the rural accessibility map. Updated three years ago. Well, that means that there's somebody there who's done some work on rural accessibility and maybe we've found a friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is good. Good to know that. So I, I, I'd be really pleased if we could continue this conversation in the VI list. There's so many things that uh, would be really helpful. And if we can get O'Reilly, if we can exert a positive influence on O'Reilly, that would be very nice. I'm going to stop. Just, I'll just make one final comment here, then it's probably time for me to sign off and head off to lunch. Um, with my experimentation of the last day and a half, it seems that Toolbox and DistroBox are available only on the very latest bleeding edge operating systems. Some of the more traditional standard ones like Red Hat 7 and so on, probably OpenSUSE and the like, just don't have the packages. Now this, it, it may well be possible that there are third-party packages one can download onto these older systems to get these capabilities. But um, for example, most of our hundreds of workstations are running Ubuntu 20.04 and neither Toolbox nor DistroBox are in the package system on that OS. When we upgrade to 22.04, which will happen during the summer, then it will be accessible. I so I, this I means suspect. that plenty of people with existing systems won't be able to run Toolbox and, and DistroBox yet until I they upgrade they will, their operating system. I, 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 I suspect that they will work. It's just that you can't do it through the usual package interface. Hmm. I suspect that they work, but they're not packaged. Um, and I... I got an impression, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit ignorant in all of this, that the main obstacle is the version of glibc. Nelson nods wisely. Yeah. Yeah, it's the kernel and the C library, which are the, the core of all other software in an operating system. 
So uh, this is certainly true when new features are added to either the kernel or the C library that other programs take advantage of. That means older systems are locked out. Yeah, and and the kernel also has to support the KVM stuff whenever that was added, but that's been around for ages, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, we have older hardware that didn't have the the hardware enable at the BIOS level for virtualization. Virtualization would still work on them, but it was notably slower. Uh, fortunately, we've we've had machines evolve to the point that all of our main servers now have virtualization support and any new system we buy typically has it. So it isn't an issue anymore. Rod, do you have any, I'll be, I'll be very pleased if you have some closing words. I missed that, Jonathan. Would you like to say anything to our viewers before we go? No, I, it was a pleasure being here. It, it's fascinating discussion. Um, I must talk to you sometime about um, doing computer hardware in the dark. Um, the closest I get to that is that my PC is under my desk and it's quite inaccessible and it's a bit of a job to get it out. So I lie under the desk and I have to use a flashlight to see what's going on. <laughs> Well, if, if you if you were to get to that level, I can tell you that it is it is very powerful. I, I you know, the days when I used to uh, uh, do litigation in the courtroom, uh, you know, one of the ways I used to mess with my sighted colleagues is that I would, uh, you know, in Microsoft Word, you 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 change the color of the text to white, so I could carelessly leave my laptop on on, on the desk. And you know, peering eyes wouldn't be able to see, you know, my notes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, if you, if you were to get to that level, it's 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 very good. Sometimes I, you know, so I, I've I've been known to close the the, uh, the lid of my laptop, and I'm still reading content with my braille display. So, yeah. Uh, we should be. It'll be nice to meet you again. I hope we have the opportunity. Absolutely.